Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor in electrical and software engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering. And in this lecture, we are basically going to conclude the design of our microarchitecture. And, and this is actually going to, I'm going to split this lecture into two parts. So this is going to be split over two videos. But the next two video lectures are basically kind of the culmination of everything we've been talking about in the lectures so far. So we've we've been talking about microarchitectures, we've been talking about memory design, we've been talking about um, binary numbers, ALU design, and this is where we're going to bring it all together. And so in the next two videos, we're going to actually finish the design of a very simple microarchitecture that is able to execute a series of machine language instructions, um, a series of AVR microcontroller machine language instructions. Now, again, I, I don't claim that what I'm presenting is the actual design of an AVR microcontroller, but it is one possible design of a digital machine that executes the exact same machine language that runs on real um, AVR chips. So one of the new ideas or terminologies now that our microarchitecture is about to get a little bit more complicated is the introduction of the concepts of a data path and a control path. And just to introduce the definitions, first of all, the data path is the part of our microarchitecture hardware that's responsible for accessing and executing machine language commands. So you can think of the data path as where the actual data of our calculations flow, that where the variable values are flowing and where the actual operations are done on values. The control path is basically the part of the microarchitecture that's responsible for the configuration and control of the blocks that do the actual calculations. So you can think of the control path as controlling the blocks that make up the data path. And what I've tried to do is sort of show that in a very sort of high level way in this in this slide. So up until now, we've been talking um, pretty much exclusively about the data path. So we've we've talked about uh, we've presented a design for instruction memory uh, that you know, includes a, a program counter that reads out uh, machine language instructions from instruction memory sequentially. We've talked about the design of a high speed area of memory called the register file. So instruction memory um, then sort of flows into the register file and also the ALU. So based on the instructions, we may pull values out of the register file, perform a calculation on them with the ALU, and perhaps write the result to data memory, or maybe these results sort of feed back and are stored in the registers, um, depending on the, on the command that we're doing. And so this is the part of the, um, the microarchitecture that's known as the data path. But already we have started to notice, or maybe you have started to notice, that each of the blocks in our data path have a series of control lines. So for example, the data memory has a control line that controls whether or not we write a value to the data memory. Um, same thing with the register file. The ALU has, our ALU design had a three bit control bus. And depending on how we set the values of that control bus, we could do things like addition or subtraction or um, a bitwise and operation. And so the control path is basically responsible for setting all those control lines, hence the name. And how does the control path know how to configure the data path? Basically, it does this based on something called the opcode field in the machine language instruction. So all machine language instructions, and again, remember machine languages, machine language instructions are basically just binary um, strings. All machine language instructions have a portion of their sort of binary signature set aside to identify which command is being executed. So there will be a, a, a little field in the machine language instruction called the opcode field that will be set a certain way if we're trying to do an addition operation, set another way if we're trying to store something to memory and so on. And the opcode information is passed up into the control path. And based on that, 
The control path will set the control lines in the data path to execute the command indicated by the opcode. And just to sort of keep things, keep the diagrams a little bit more neat or, or clear, hopefully, I'm going to start to use blue to represent control lines. And I'm not going to talk too much about how the control path is implemented, but you can think of it just basically as a, as a large sort of combinational logic kind of machine that takes an opcode input and then has, you know, a series of operations that determine the, the control line outputs that are appropriate for, for that command. Um, so we're still going to, in the coming slides, focus pretty much entirely on the data path, but I will start to indicate control lines in blue so you can sort of understand where the control, um, the control path would interface with the data path. So when we last, so um, we've, we've had a number of lectures sort of leading up to this one where we've talked kind of about general terms, number representation, ALU design. Um, and it's been a while since we've looked at a picture of our microarchitecture. But when we last did look at our microarchitecture, this is what it looked like. So when we left off our design, we had a fully implemented instruction memory and program counter. We talked about, we've talked about how to design the register file and what the registers are used for. We've talked about how to design data memory. And we configured our data path to perform an addition operation. And just as a reminder, the addition operation is done using registers. And so we've got a register we might that is represented in the AVR instruction um, set manual as RD. So we take the values stored in two registers, RD and RR. We add them together and then we store the result back into RD. And so we have um, one, the address or the number of one register, let's say RD. Um, oh no, sorry, RR. On address bus A2. We have RD on address bus A1, RD also on um, address bus A3. And so the, um, the value stored in register RR comes out of on the RD2 bus. The value stored in RD comes out on the RD1 bus. We go into our ALU, we configure it to perform addition, and the result gets fed back and written back into the RD register because the RD um, register number is also on address bus A3. And so that's just kind of a recap of where we were. And so now what I wanna do is I wanna take this microarchitecture and generalize it. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna generalize this microarchitecture so we can perform more commands than just addition. And what we're gonna see is that you know, for all of the commands that we talked about in our ALU, um, you know, and, or addition, subtraction, we can basically perform all of them essentially with this exact microarchitecture with just a few modifications. So this is the microarchitecture design capable of executing the AVR machine language instructions for add, subtract, and, and, or. So the four operations that we implemented in our ALU um, can be implemented, or the machine language instructions for the four operations we implemented in our ALU can be implemented using this exact microarchitecture. You'll see that there's just a, a few differences between this diagram and the one on the previous slide. The first difference is that I have now started to show the control lines that would be under the control of the control path. Down here at the bottom of the slide, I have also shown the 16-bit um, the 
machine language instruction that corresponds to the add, subtract, and and or operations. And what you're gonna see is that the 16-bit machine language instruction format or has exactly the same format for all four commands. And so in all four cases, we need to specify two registers, RD and RR. So for add, RD, the value in register RD is equal to RD plus RR. So we take the values from RD and RR, add them together, and then put them back in RD. For subtract, RD is equal to RD minus R, R. I'm getting a little crowded here. Um, for and, whoops. RD is equal to RD bitwise anded with RR and so on. So for all four of these instructions, we have to specify two registers. Um, remember that our registers, we have 32 um, possible registers. So our registers, um, the numbers that indicate which register we want to work with have to be five bits long. Um, the AVR instruction set has kind of a strange way of sort of organizing their bits. So they put the five bit number for the RD register kind of in the middle of the number for the RR register. So the least significant four bits for RR are right down here. And then the most significant bit is placed up there. And I'm not sure exactly why they do that. It, it probably makes the design of the actual AVR microarchitecture simpler in some way, but I, I don't exactly know how. And up here on, at the top of the microarchitecture, we can see some lines that I've started to, that I've drawn in blue. Now, the opcode are bits 15 through 10, right? So this is the part of the machine language instruction that will indicate whether or not we're doing an and, an or, a subtraction, or um, an addition. So the opcode bits are basically going up. They're an input into the control path. The output of the control path is the setting that we use for register write enable and ALU control. So for all of our calculations, because we're storing the result back into um, register RD, Register write enable are, is going to be equal to one for all four of our calculation commands. Um, ALU control, however, will change. So if we want to perform um, and, ALU control is going to be zero, zero, zero. Um, if we want to perform addition, it's going to be zero, one, zero, and, uh, and so on. So let's do a specific example. So in this example, we are going to configure our microarchitecture to run the assembly language command and R20 comma R5. And so this means that we're going to take a bitwise, the bitwise and of the eight bit value stored in R20 and the eight bit value stored in R5, and we're gonna store the result back into R20. So this is the calculation that we're going to perform. This, is the 16-bit opcode, or sorry, this is the 16-bit machine language instruction that will execute this exact command. One of the documents that I've uploaded to the course website is the AVR instruction set manual. And in that AVR instruction set manual, it gives the 16-bit binary um, machine language instructions for every AVR machine language command. And so that's where this, um, binary string comes from. This isn't sort of arbitrary or something I've made up. This is the actual AVR machine language um, instruction. And like I said on the previous slide, um, this 16-bit instruction follows this format, right? So we have um, the first four bits 
are the least significant bits of um, RR. Next, we have five bits that specify RD. Whoops, um, to use capitals here. So this is RD. This bit is the most significant bit in RR. And so RD is equal to the number 20, because we're working with register 20 up here. RR is equal to the number five, because we're working with R5. And then this six bit value is the opcode. So this 001000 indicates that we want to do an AND operation. If we were doing an addition or a subtraction, this opcode value would be different. And you can find the specific opcode values in the AVR instruction manual. And to just sort of round out this example, uh, it's useful to sort of take a look at how the control path would configure the control lines and what exactly we might have on our different address buses. So in order to perform an add operation, the value of ALU control would be set by the control path as 0, 0, 0. And that's consistent with how we designed the ALU. Because we're writing um, a value into register R20. The register write enable line would be equal to one. And it's useful to, again, just to sort of uh, reinforce what's going on here, to also write down what we would have on the different register, register file address buses. So, on address bus um, A1, address bus A1 and A3 both would have the register number for uh, register 20. And because A1 and A3 would have um, the value for our, our RD, our destination register. And so that corresponds to 10100 binary, which is 20 in base 10. 20. Um, this comes from, just to clean things up here, this comes from this part of the uh, machine language instruction. And the value on A2 is a value for RR, which is 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, which corresponds to the number 5. And that's from these four bits plus this one. And um, just a reminder also in the diagram, I, I indicate the bits that are flow onto each of these buses. So um, RD are correspond to bits eight through four in the 16-bit uh, machine language instruction. And RR corresponds to bit nine concatenated with bits three through zero. And so this is basically how um, we perform calculations which with our um, microarchitecture. So basically we can feed, we can pull any 16-bit instruction out of our instruction memory with the um, machine language command for add, subtract, and or or. And all of the blocks that we've designed will perform that calculation on the value stored in our um, 20 and R5, and then store the result back into R20. So I, I, th I think that we're kind of at an exciting point because in this previous slide, we've 
created a little computer that can do calculations based on the commands that we give it in instruction memory. But it's not really a super exciting little computer. And one of the things that you might um, already be sort of um, wondering about is, you know, it's fine for us to be doing calculations on values stored in the register file, but how do we get values there in the first place, right? Like how do we put meaningful numbers into the register file for us to perform our calculations on? And that's what the load and store commands are for. So the AVR microarchitecture is what's known as a load store microarchitecture. And so basically, we use load commands to read values from memory into registers where we can perform calculations on them. And then we use store commands to take values from registers and write those values back to data memory. We cannot perform addition, subtraction, any kind of ALU operation directly on values in data memory. We have to read them from data memory into a register and then perform our calculations on the register. And it's important to remember that, you know, it's not just sort of like data memory sort of variables that we can access with loads and stores. We can also access the peripherals of our microcontroller. So for example, if we have some digital input that is present on sort of the, the digital IO pins um, on our, our microcontroller, that information will show up in a what we refer to as a control register in the um, inside the microcontroller. Remember, these control registers are not resident in the data file. Instead, they're basically areas in data memory. So um, variables are stored in a certain region of data memory, and then the values that are present on our I.O. pins are stored at other addresses in data memory. And so basically what I'm trying to say is that the load store commands can be used not only to interact with variables in data memory, but also to interact with the peripherals available in the microcontroller. And you'll get more practice with that with in, during the hands-on exercises. And so, again, there are a variety of um, commands in the AVR instruction set, and we're going to focus on just two of them. There's a the LD command, which is called the load indirect from data space to register command, and which is kind of a long name, <clears throat> and the store command, which is the store indirect from register to data space um, command. And both the, the LD and the ST commands use registers X, Y, and Z. Now, this might ring a bell because I talked about the X, Y, Z registers back in um, our, our register lecture. So remember that the data memory in our AVR microarchitecture uses 16-bit addresses, but our registers are only 8 bits. And so we use pairs of registers together to create a 16-bit data memory address. <clears throat> and we refer to those pairs as the X pair, the Y pair, or the Z pair. Um, so the X pair corresponds to registers 26 and 27. The Y pair are 28 and 29. And the Z pair are 30 and 31. So if we want to read a value from data memory, we put the address into one of these pairs of registers. We execute the LD command, and that reads the value from data memory and writes it into a register. And the store command basically works the same, except in reverse. OK, so now to get into this load store thing in a, in a little bit more um, depth, let's look at uh, a microarchitecture or modifications to the microarchitecture that can execute the load command. And then we'll look at modifications that will allow us to execute the store command. Now, when you're writing the load command in assembly language, you basically write LD, then you give the register that you want to load your value into, and then you indicate if you want to use the X register pair, Y register pair, or Z register pair. So you choose one of these. And I should say in the instruction set, 
manual, the AVR instruction set manual, there are a bunch of different variations on the load command and a bunch of different kinds of load commands. Load commands that will automatically increment the address in your register pair to read the next value. If, for example, you're reading um, from an array of values in consecutive memory um, or ones that will add an arbitrary offset for your next read command and so on. You can check it out if you want, but we're going to focus on the simple ones in, in the lecture. This is how the 16-bit machine language uh, command for load is formatted. There's quite a bit of the machine language uh, command dedicated to opcode. So we actually have, um, I believe this is seven bits of opcode at the start, and then four more bits, um, the four least significant bits also dedicated to opcode. And in the middle, bits eight through four is what specifies the, the destination register. There's more bits ch um, chosen for opcode or used up for opcode here, partly because we um, only need to specify one register value, so we don't need to have a bunch of other register values. And also partly because there are a lot of different variations on the, on the load command. And so if we look at a specific example, we could write the assembly language command load r2 comma x. That basically takes the value in data memory stored at the address contained in the x register pair and copies it into register r2. And so in this middle five bits, this is what specifies r2 and the region here and the region here are all opcode. So let's consider now an example, or let, let's assume for, for this example, that register R26 stores value hex one and R27 stores hex zero zero. These two values are going to be concatenated together. The higher register always holds the upper byte of the 16-bit address. So this corresponds to, um, whoops, uh, data address equal to 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And, um, that corresponds if this is if this diagram represents the contents of our, our data memory that corresponds to this location in data memory and so the value hex 34 is then copied into register r2 and so that's basically how load works it's um, hopefully relatively straightforward if we take a look at the data path this is the data path. Um, this is how we need to modify our data path in order to execute the load instruction. Now, our microarchitecture is starting to get more and more complicated because I am going to add on to the microarchitecture that is able to uh, perform the calculations, right? So rather than showing you a, a special microarchitecture that can only do load, I'm going to design a microarchitecture that can do all the commands we're talking about. So this microarchitecture here is still able to perform add, subtract, and an or, and now we're adding stuff to it that will allow it to execute the load command as well. And you can see things are going to get more and more complicated, and this is the nature of microarchitecture design. Um, even with this very sort of simplified scaled down example that we're working with, you can see you know, we don't have to add very many machine language instructions to our design before um, it gets to be fairly complex. So what modifications have we performed? Well, not surprisingly, we now have connections to our data memory, which makes sense. We're trying to load data from data memory and write it into a register. And we also have connections that will allow us to control the data memory.
Okay, so there's a lot going on in this diagram. So let's maybe start from the left and move towards the right. So the first thing you'll notice is that we have different opcode bits, whoops, different opcode bits going up into our control path. The control path looks at, you know, in this case, we'll make use of the first seven bits and the, the seven most significant bits and the four least significant bits. And you might say, well, you know, how does the control path know which opcode bits to look at? Basically, the control path looks at all 16 bits and essentially does a pattern match for all possible opcode combinations um, and all possible sort of opcode fields. So the opcode information goes up into the control path. Now, the first thing we need to do is create our 16-bit data address. And we have specified in our assembly language command that um, we want to use the X register pair. So that corresponds to registers 26 and registers 27. Now, the numbers 26 and 27 are not stored anywhere in our machine language instruction. They are only implied by the opcode that corresponds to the load X command. So if we have X, that gives us a certain opcode. If we instead specified Y, that would change our opcode. And since the opcode flows into the control path, it's actually the control path that needs to indicate which register pair that we are um, working with. And so that's why we've added this pointer, whoops, that's why we've added this pointer register input and also a multiplexer controlled by this memory operation um, control line. So basically, <clears throat> if we start to um, fill in you know the the values that we would um, we would have on each one of these control lines for this particular command the value of the pointer register bus and this is an 8-bit bus is equal to one one zero one zero binary which corresponds to the number 26 so Pointer, the pointer register bus contains the number of the first register in our address pair. This goes into um, the A2 bus. Now remember, when we designed our register file, we designed it to basically be able to read from two consecutive registers at the same time for the purpose of this 16-bit addressing. So when we have the number 26 on um, bus A2, we have the value for register, um, oops, register 26 on the RD2 bus, and the value for register 27 on the RD2 upper bus. And that basically allows us to concatenate those two 16-bit values together or sorry, those two 8-bit values together to, um, to create a 16-bit um, address. So this bus is the combination of RD2 and RD2 upper. So we have RD2 upper and RD2 concatenated together to form um, 16 bits. And that goes into our address line on our memory. So that's going to indicate the location in memory that we want to read from. Okay. So as soon as we specify a 16-bit um, address at A, the value at that address location is going to show up at um, register or sorry read bus RD and. Um, if, if you don't remember this, it's, it's worthwhile going back to our memory design lecture to remind yourself how, how data memory works. But whatever address we put at A will immediately appear, the value will immediately appear at RD. 
and it goes through this multiplexer, is fed back around to the right input for the, um, for the register file. The address or the value for the A3 register address bus for the calculation for the add, um, subtract, and and or calculations were bits eight through four in the machine language instruction. And that still works for load because it's, it's, it's bits eight through four that specify our destination register R2. And so this properly um, specifies the register that we're, we're trying to write to. Now, just to kind of consolidate all of this, I'm gonna add a few more, just very specifically add uh, write down the, the values that are um, uh, going to be present on all of these uh, all of these control lines. So um, when we're doing a load command, the memory op control line is equal to one. The register write enable is also equal to one because we're writing a value into the register file. We do have values on our address buses. The value on address bus A2, and let me I'm going to clear away some of this clutter so we can see what's going on here a bit better. Because memory op is equal to one, whoops, the value on the pointer register bus flows through this multiplexer and shows up at A2. So the five bit value on A2 is equal to 11010 or 26. Um, the value on A3 is equal to the um, bits 8 through 4, which specifies the number 2 because we're writing to register R2. And we've also introduced the memory write enable control line. Because we're reading from memory and not writing to it, the memory write enable line is equal to zero. And you'll notice that the memory op control line controls not only this multiplexer, but this one as well. And so when memory op is set equal to one, the value from the data memory flows back into, into WD3. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a few control lines that have um, don't care values. So for example, we're not using the value from RD1 for the load command. So A1 is don't care. And also we're not using the ALU for this load command. So it's three control lines are don't care as well. Um, and that's it. So that's, that's how our, our microarchitecture is configured for, for a, a load command. Now it's worthwhile just sort of convincing ourselves also that we haven't ruined our microarchitecture design if we want to go back and do a calculation. So what if we wanted to do a calculation? What if we wanted to subtract something or add something? So we've, let's say we've got, we've run a couple of load commands to load values into a few registers and now we want to add them together. Um, do all these new additions kind of ruin things for um, our calculation? Well, it doesn't. The calculation, um, and I'll just erase this down here. So if we want to do a calculation with this new enhanced data path, the 
ALU control command um, or bus is set just the way it was before. Register write enable was set just the way it was before. And the only thing we do is we set the mem op control line to zero. So if we're not doing a memory operation, we set mem op to zero. And that means that bits nine and three through zero will flow through to A2, just like it did for the calculation command. And the result of the ALU will flow through and get fed back into the write bus, not the result from read from, from memory. And so it's important for you to convince yourself that as we add functionality to the um, to the microarchitecture, we're not sort of wrecking or invalidating anything that's that's come before. So at this point, I think it's worthwhile pausing. If you've been watching this video all the way through, pause the video at this point, take a break, and just step back from this for a second, right? Things are starting to get quite complicated. Um, we're adding a lot to this design. We're gonna add even more to the design to implement the store command. We're gonna add even more in the next lecture. And things are gonna look pretty complicated pretty quickly. The best strategy for understanding this stuff is to just take it one piece at a time, one bus at a time, and think to yourself, okay, if I'm doing a load command, what setting for register write enable makes sense? If I'm doing an add command, what setting for ALU control makes sense? Another strategy that I find effective is also to just draw lines through the microarchitecture just like I did. Maybe print out a bunch of pieces of paper with this diagram on it, or if you have an iPad like I do, sort of scribble all over top of it like, a, like I've been doing in the lectures. And because uh, I, I find it really helpful to sort of say, okay, you know, bits and, you know, if memory op is equal to, whoops, if memory op is equal to zero, bits nine and three through zero are gonna flow through A2. That means you know, something's going to show up here and flow into the ALU. Um, these bits are going to flow into A1. That means something's going to happen here. That means maybe we're going to do addition and we're going to flow through here. What happens? Oh, do, do, are we stopped? We're not because memory op is equal to zero. So that means we flow through and we flow back around and we write in the register. So really follow the flow of information through the data path. And I think that's helpful as well. Now the store command we're going to be able to move a little bit more quickly through because it's got a lot of similarities to load, particularly with how the machine language um, instruction is formatted. So if we want to write assembly language for st the store command, um, we write st, and then this is the register that we want to copy into data memory. So remember, load reads a value from data memory, puts it in a register, store takes a value from a register and puts it back into data memory. Um, so this is the value, the source register contains the value that we're writing to data memory. And then we specify if we're using the X, the Y or the Z um, register address pair. The format for the machine language is basically exactly the same. We've got seven bits, so the seven most significant bits and the four least significant bits set aside for opcode. The values in here I'm showing are for the store X command. And the source register, um, the five bit number indicating the source register is given in bits eight through four. And let's do an example here where um, we have the assembly language instruction store register 10 at the address contained in the register pair, in the X register pair. So if we look at our machine language code, this is the, the number 10 is contained in bits eight through four. And for the purposes of our example, um, let's say register 26, contains 
two, register 27 contains zero. And so our 16-bit address is going to be 0002, just like it was for load. And let's say register 10 is equal to 0x99. When we, so this is the value stored in register 10. So when we execute the store command, the value um, at address two is going to get overwritten with the value 0x99. So this is our data path that has been further modified to support not only our calculations, not only load, but the store command as well. Now, it's pretty subtle. It's a pretty actually a very minor modification to the data path. And if you want, you can pause the video now and try to identify it for yourself. But basically, the only thing we had to do to our microarchitecture to support store is hook the RD bus up to the right bus on data memory. Um, so RD1 now is hooked up not only to the ALU, but also to the, to the right bus. Now, in our example, um, we've got the store R10 command using the X register pair. And let's sort of go through and write out all of our, um, all of our control lines. So, whoops. First of all, our memory operator control line is equal to one because we're performing a, another memory operation store this time. Um, the pointer register eight bit bus, because we're still using the X register pair is gonna be equal to um, one one zero one zero or in other words 26 and so that value 26 so is going to flow through for address a2 and that means that the values in register 26 and the values in register 27 are going to get concatenated together into a 16-bit address and fed into the address bus of the data memory. This time, um, so let me write more. our address buses. So A2 again is equal to 11010 or 26. This time we actually do use the A1 input. So a1 is equal to, um, is hooked up to uh, read bits eight through four. And this has been the same for all of our um, instructions so far, right? The calculation instructions and for load. In this case, this contains the number 10, which is stored up here. And so that means the value stored in register 10 shows up on RD1 and it does still go into the ALU, but the ALU isn't used. And in addition to going into the ALU, it's also feeds into the write bus for memory write enable or for the, for the data memory. Because we're writing to memory this time, memory write enable is now equal to one. And because we're not modifying any registers, register write enable is set to zero for the first time. This is super important actually, because with this microarchitecture design, even though we're writing to data memory, there's still gonna be something that shows up on the read bus from our data memory. And because memory op is equal to one, this garbage value essentially is still going to be fed back 
to the right input of the register. But because we've set register write enable equal to zero, our register values are safe from being modified by this garbage value. So because we're not writing to a register, we don't care what we have at A3. Because we're not using the ALU, we don't care what um, the ALU control lines are either. And so this is our configuration for, um, for store. Now, just like we did for load, I want you to pause the video now and then figure out for yourself how you would set these control commands to, or the, the control lines, the blue lines, how you would set it to still perform a calculation or still perform a load. You should see that all of the, the calculations are still intact by adding the functionality for store. We haven't um, you know, compromised the ability to still do a load command or still do a calculation. And so now we've got a much more interesting computer, right? So now not only can we perform operations on values, we can read those values from data memory into the registers that we use for calculation. And then once we have a result from our calculation, we can write that back into data memory. So it could be modifying a variable, or it could be reading from a memory mapped IO register and then writing a new value back to an IO register, maybe to um, turn on an LED or something like that. So the last command I wanna do in this lecture is load immediate. Now, the load command loads values from data memory and store, stores values in data memory, but sometimes the programmer, like sometimes we just know we want to load a constant. We want to into a, into a register, right? Like let's say we want to initialize a register to zero or we want to initialize a register like let's say R26 and R27, we want to initialize those registers to have a, a specific memory address maybe. And the programmer knows what that value is supposed to be and the programmer is okay with, with that being a constant sort of embedded in the, um, the machine language instruction itself. And this is what's known as an immediate. So an immediate is a number embedded directly in the machine language instruction. This means that it's basically a constant and it can't change after the, the program has been compiled. And the load immediate command basically copies an immediate from a machine language instruction directly into a register. So um, the syntax for this, um, if we're writing it in assembly language, is LDI, then we give the destination register that we're copying um, our value into, comma, and then the value we want to copy into the register. And so this is kind of a nice thing. Like let's say we wanted to initialize uh, register 20 to zero, we would write LDI R20 0x00. So if we look at how the machine language instruction is formatted, our registers are, whoops, Our registers are eight bits, so we need to have an eight bit value. The eight bits of our value are again split up. So the for least significant four bits are in the least significant four bits of the machine language instruction. We then have four bits to um, specify our destination register, and then we have another four bits to um, that contain the four most significant bits of our value, and then the rest is opcode. Now you might say, hey, wait a minute, we've got 32 registers, but we've only allocated four bits to specify our destination register. And if you notice that, you would be correct. This means that we can't use load immediate with all of the registers in the register file. We can only use um, it to initialize the top 16 of the registers. And so um, the destination register can be registers 16 through 31. So basically um, a value of 16 is added to 
um, whatever is contained in this destination register field in order to get um, the actual destination register number. The, you, might, you might ask, it's like, okay, well, if we can only use this command with 16 um, registers, why the upper 16 and not the lower 16? It's basically because load immediate is used very, very commonly to initialize the X, Y, and Z um, register pairs for addressing data memory for the load and store commands. And so that's why load immediate, will, so load immediate, if because it works with the top 16 registers, it can access um, registers 26 through 31, which correspond to the X, Y, and Z register pairs. And so we can use load immediate to initialize um, certain addresses in data memory that we can then subsequently use the load and store command with. Okay, so the load immediate command is added to our microarchitecture using one new control line, a single bit control line that's called load immediate or LDIM, and two multiplexers. Both of these multiplexers are connected to load immediate that essentially change the inputs to A3 and WD3. So let's go through an example to see how this works. So for this particular example, we are executing load immediate R17255. So we're going to load the value 255 into register 17. If we look at our memory language instruction, the least significant nibble of our value is stored in the first four bits. The most significant nibble of 255 is stored up here. This middle nibble stores our register value, our destination register. It doesn't store the number 17, it stores the number one because we add 16 to whatever value is stored in, this, in these four bits. And that's what happens down here. So if load immediate is equal to zero, bits eight through four travel through to um, address A3, and that supports all of the other commands that we've been using up until now. However, if load immediate is equal to one, bits seven through four are added with 16, and that value is fed through to A3. If, whoops. If load immediate is equal to zero, then this feedback line is fed into the register file write bus. And somehow this got disconnected on my slide anyway. Um, and so this feedback line contains the result from the ALU or the result from data memory, depending on how we set um, the mem op line. However, if load immediate is equal to one, this feedback line is disconnected. And instead, we concatenate bits 11 through eight and three through zero. And that's what is fed into the right bus of our register file. So this is basically our, our immediate value. And so if we um, want to write down sort of our, our control lines, so in order to execute load immediate, obviously the load immediate control line has to be equal to one. Um, the memory op control line is equal to zero because we're not doing a, a memory operation. Register write enable is equal to one because we are modifying a register. We're writing the immediate value into the register. Um, memory write enable is equal to zero because there still are gonna be values floating around on these buses and we don't want um, them to basically corrupt our, our data memory.
the value of a3 is equal to 1 plus 16. So we have um, the value 17 on a3. And remember, that's these four bits added together with, with 16. And everything else is don't care. So we don't care what's on these two address buses. We don't care what the ALU is doing with itself. Um, and we don't care what pointer register is doing up here either. So that's the conclusion for this first part of the sort of ultimate um, microarchitecture design lecture. Again, lots of content in this lecture. And, you know, the best way to do this, it, you know, don't expect to absorb this the first time you go through it. Rewind this video, pause it, work through these examples, print out the diagrams from the slides, get a, your own pen or marker and mark them up or do it on, on, you know, on your tablet and just work through these examples. Um, what I would recommend is take this final microarchitecture that I'm showing on this last slide, which is our most complicated one, and make sure you can still do an addition operation with it. Make sure you can still do subtraction. Um, write out the machine language, the 16-bit machine language instructions for all of these things and satisfy yourself that, you know, the bits that I've specified through here make sense and all these multiplexers work. Really spend some time with this because, um, you know, it's not, it's not meant to be tricky. It's the same every time. Once you get it, you've got it. It's not going to change. Um, but it does take a little bit of um, does take a little bit of work to to really sort of get a handle on what's going on here.